Hey everybody, and welcome to Planet Zoo. This is my first real video of the game, I suppose, given that it's not the beta anymore. And if you're wondering how I put this video out so quickly, basically me and a bunch of other people got early access press release copies of the game just to prepare stuff for the release date on YouTube, which is uh, one of the perks of being a YouTuber, I guess. Although at the same time, I have to say, uh, I got this a week ago, and in all this time, I've only managed to make this one video, so I haven't really made the most out of it. Uh, but in my defense, I spent most of that time just messing about in the game, trying to get used to the pieces and trying to practice a little bit, uh, because, well, I like to keep my channel based on the assumption that I'm somewhat knowledgeable and experienced about the things that I'm doing, uh, which means that a lot of time goes into these videos just researching and practicing what I want to do. Uh, but especially when a new game, new game comes out like, uh, like this, I really want to put a lot of effort into making sure I know what to do and how to do things in the game before I move on to making YouTube videos. And the same kind of also goes for the strange, unusual format of this video. As you can see, I'm not really starting a series yet. At least this video is not called part one. Unfortunately, maybe I should have done that because search engine optimization, that's how you rake in the views, I suppose. Um, but no, I don't want to do that kind of thing just yet because for now, I just want to keep practicing and use these videos as a way to explore the game, see what you can do with it. Uh, see what the scenery pieces and the animals are like, and once I feel confident enough to build a full park, then I'll make a complete zoo series. So that's my plan for now. So I'm continuing the standalone builds of the zoo beta uh, with this build, which I should probably actually introduce. We're <laughs> three minutes into the video and I haven't even talked about it. So in this video, I'll be building a Japanese macaque's habitat. Uh, we're just gonna call them snow monkeys, I guess, from now on, because that's what people usually call them. And I have to say, it is a really cute name. And so, fitting with the Japanese theme, I decided to build this whole, uh, or to start this whole build off with uh, a building inspired by the Japanese Imperial Palace in Chiyoda in Tokyo. Although, not really the palace itself, which is more of a modernist reconstruction at this point, but rather uh, the moats and the walls that are around the palace, which feature these really cool towers at the corners, uh, which are kind of like mini castles. Uh, those things are really cool, and they're probably more famous, at least their pictures are, than the actual palace itself, which is rarely open to visitors. Uh, it's really only a couple of days a year, I believe, for instance, when it's the emperor's birthday. Uh, but yeah, you mostly just see the, the moats if you're an average person like me. Uh, but yeah, it's really beautiful, and that's what I was inspired by to make this little building. And I'm trying to at least uh, keep the promise that I made in the Chinese uh, Formosan bear habitats, that I will try to you know, keep the animal habitats very natural and keep the cultural elements to uh, different parts of the zoo. But this building in particular will be a sort of a decoration going over the holding area for the macaques. So they won't be actually sheltering or anything like this in here. Um, but this does hide what will in the future be a, a much more simple sort of backstage thing uh, in which the macaques can shelter and uh, can be cared for. And whatever backstage elements you would need, which I'm not going to detail, but you know, staff area, uh, a kitchen, things like this. So while it's not really necessary to theme it this much, it is definitely uh, a bit of an over-the-top theming. I think it's at least somewhat vindicated by the fact that it is over an actual functioning structure which you do need to care for the animals. And the rest of this habitat is mostly inspired by Japanese gardens, although here again I do want to be quite strict and uh, restrict the actual Japanese garden elements to the, the elements, to the parts where the humans will be. So, when it comes to stone lanterns and decorations like that, I won't be putting those inside the habitats, but definitely around the surrounding area. And the same goes for some of the very typical Japanese foliage that you can see in Japanese gardens as well. It won't be a, a full Japanese garden build, although if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, check out my uh, Japanese gardens planet coaster series, which I made a while ago, uh, but rather just 
some basic elements in this area to make it all feel a bit more immersive and a bit more Japanese, while at the same time keeping the habitats for the monkeys themselves very natural. And this is also why I decided to have this small pond in the middle of the habitat. Partly it is to separate the guests and the monkeys without creating a visual barrier between the two uh, and keeping them quite close while not allowing the two to ever really meet. Uh, but at the same time, it's a very common element in Japanese gardens, especially uh, lake gardens. So it's something that I wanted to get in here just for the Japane Japanese-ness of the overall aesthetic. And, you know, it's an excuse to build a stone bridge with a bunch of detailing, which will hopefully look quite nice when all of the foliage is in as well. Now, speaking of uh, the monkeys and a bit about the habitat itself and what went into my idea for the habitat design, I do know that Japanese monkeys are decent swimmers, so uh, these guys won't be able to actually you know, swim across the water and reach the guests. I'll try to have some anti-climbing stuff everywhere. Obviously the uh, habitat borders will have anti-climbing things on top of them, um, but hopefully putting some metal grids and things like this over the pillars and the walls of the paths will prevent the monkeys from climbing onto them. I'm not sure actually, I haven't tested this yet. I just hope that the game will not allow the monkeys to climb, climb that sort of thing, because in real life I'm pretty sure it should be possible to stop them from climbing into the guest areas with that. And I'm saying that with a, a decent amount of certainty. I did base this habitat on quite a bit of research on real life Japanese macaque habitats, because Personally, I haven't seen a lot. Uh, the only one that I think I've seen in person is the one in Tobu Zoo, which was actually part of why I really wanted to start off with the Japanese macaques as my first ever Planet Zoo, you know, full game build. Uh, because I remember seeing that habitat and uh, they have this hot spring in their exhibit, which is really cool, uh, perched on top of these rocks. It's not a very nice exhibit, actually, I have to say. But I really loved the idea of the hot spring, and the monkeys were actually chilling in that as well. Uh, so that was nice, quite stereotypical behavior, I guess, as far as the sort of touristy idea of what Japanese macaques do is concerned. Um, but yeah, I thought that was really cool, so I wanted to do something like that at some point. And then lo and behold, Planet Zoo came out, and my, my dream of building a, a, a snow monkey onsen is now pretty much a reality. Now, aside from Tobu Zoo, I also looked up a lot of pictures about the Detroit Zoo and Lincoln Park Zoo um, habitats as well, as well as on Zulex, the Tokiwa Zoo and the, Grain and the Great Plains Zoo, which, by the way, for any budding zoo creators out there playing this game, Zulex is a really cool website that somebody linked to me on Twitter a long time ago, and I don't remember who this was, so if you're watching this video, I'm... Very sorry that I can't give you a shout out here. Um, but yeah, somebody told me about this a while ago. Zulex is a website with lots of reference images and a uh, crazy amount of detail uh, regarding the all kinds of exhibits, really, of all kinds of animals all over the world. And you can really find a lot of information on this, uh, be it the, the size of habitats, the design philosophy that goes into them, uh, how the animals and guests are separated uh, and how animal welfare is kept in check in the design. Uh, it's just a really cool website to look into if you're ever looking for inspiration or information on certain animals when you're building a habitat. Zulex is definitely a great place to check out and even just randomly exploring the website uh, seeing what's out there is really interesting as well. At least <laughs> I guess if you're kind of like me and your idea of procrastinating is going on Wikipedia or Google Maps and just looking up anything and everything. Um, so yeah, that would be my recommendation of the day. Uh, check out Zulex, I'll link it down in the description. Uh, it's really cool and it really helped me out with uh, coming up with ideas for this habitat as well. Anyway, I'm starting to run behind on things that I wanted to talk about during the video. So uh, more stuff that I want to mention about the habitat itself. I wanted to feature a lot of rock work and try to mix not just the foliage but also the terraforming with it in, uh, in a conscious way. And this is something that I got really inspired about from Sean McBeard's videos. He's a YouTuber 
who makes really cool Planet 2 YouTube videos uh, in German. I do have to give that FYI. So if you speak German, or at least understand it mostly like me, uh, I would really recommend his channel. He's really good at the game. He's, uh, he's an old veteran player of Planet Coaster who made amazing stuff and then never finished it. <clears throat> um, but yeah, it's, it's really cool. And especially his Wolf Habitat uh, videos featured some really cool rock work that kind of blew my mind. Um, because he, he really purposefully set out the terraforming uh, to create these sort of height gaps to later fill them in with rock work. Which is something that I never really thought about that way and just started experimenting with a bit in the rock work in this habitat. So you can see a lot of that uh, sort of horizontal layers of rock work covering in uh, some of the holes in the terraforming, some of the, the, jump, the, the height gaps, uh, which is really cool. It just allows the rock work to blend with the terraforming a lot more and to not just you know pop out as a bunch of random rocks from the ground uh, because as we all know 90% of YouTube videos on Planet Zoo are just people placing rocks so if it's gonna be that big a part of the game might as well try and get good at it so it's been a fun practice to uh, get a bit better at rock work and trying to make it a bit more natural and realistic also I'm thinking of this right now so I just wanna uh, <laughs> shout this out if you notice that my voice sounds a bit iffy, I'm under the weather again. Once again, I keep getting a cold recently. Uh, I don't know why it just keeps happening, uh, but this is pretty bad timing, so I'm just trying to power through and I'll edit out some of the coughs and sniffles when I'm done recording. But yeah, uh, if, if, you, if my voice isn't exactly up to standard, then that's why I'm gonna need to live a healthier life. I don't know, change my diet or something. Actually, that's not the problem. I need to go outside more. But then there's also Planet 2. Anyway, uh, I, I, need to, I need to get back on topic. That would also be great. So, uh, something that I should also definitely come back to, which I talked about a bit in the uh, Chinese habitat video, is that I really want to make the, the nature in the habitat quite realistic. Obviously, there are a lot of cultural elements around the habitat, which I want to keep outside the habitat or just outside the habitat itself. Uh, but to make nature realistic and to make it look like Japanese foliage, I did have to break some in-game rules. A lot of the trees that you see around here aren't really in the Asian section of the game, um, but are really my ideas for what I could replace the generic foliage of the game uh, with. Uh, given the fact that there isn't a lot of specific Japanese foliage in the game, uh, we do have the Emperor Maple, which is cool, and we have the Cherry Tree, which is really cool. Um, but not really the kind of everyday Japanese trees like the Japanese black pine uh, or different spruces. So for the for the black pine, for instance, I ended up using Scots pines, which don't really look exactly the same, but at least they have a sort of similar structure. And I just ended up putting a bunch of North American spruces in as well. So perhaps the monkeys are going to complain about this, which to be fair, they have all the rights for. Um, but yeah, honestly, I just wanted to put in these trees to make it look a bit more realistic. Even if in-game it's not entirely correct, it's, for me at least, uh, and my suspense of disbelief, uh, a bit more believable to see these North American trees replace Japanese trees as opposed to not having any pine trees whatsoever, or just being restricted to Himalayan pines, uh, which look way less like some of the typical trees that you can find in Japan. And besides, there are some unrealistic quirks about the trees in the game as well. Uh, we have emperor maples that are red, given the fact that not all emperor maples are always red. A lot of maple trees in Japan are also just green in summer. It's a bit strange to have those around at the same time as cherry blossom trees, uh, because the sakura season is also just really short and only in spring, um, so this is kind of a, a time issue. But then again, these trees are really most well known for uh, their respective seasons, with fall really being seen as Momiji season in Japan and spring really being Sakura season. And back to the uh, topic of the animals actually, I also do want to make sure that while people can look at them from different perspectives and I'm trying to immerse the path as much as possible into the habitat of the monkeys, I do want to make sure that they have some areas where they can escape the guest views. Uh, not to mention that there's quite a social aspect to these guys as well. Uh, as far as I've been able to read, uh, they're really social animals with hierarchies as well, uh, in males and females, 
and uh, a question of animal welfare and stress uh, it really relies also on the low-ranking individuals and uh, how they feel in regards to the high-ranking individuals and how these intergroup dynamics are and you definitely want to be able to kind of allow the the low-ranking individuals especially to get away from the group every now and then if that's necessary um, so I'm trying to at least give them some hiding spots and make the habitat large enough for any individuals to get away from the group as well and as far as I'm able to tell these kinds of influences can really even play a bigger role than uh, visitor presence alone which obviously though can also be a reason for stress so definitely want to be able to allow your your monkeys to hide from people as well now in the meantime I'm working on a pavilion which will work as the main uh, guest shelter for the habitat uh, which I think is also fairly in theme my main inspiration for this was actually Mechiro Gardens in uh, Tokyo between uh, Ikebukuro and Takadano Baba station there's this old Japanese garden it's really small uh, but it was a walking distance from Rikyo University which is where I did my exchange in Japan so I went there just to chill out and relax and look at a uh, a, a Japanese garden which honestly on pictures looks really big and then if you visit it in real life it's just like wow this is this is really small uh, but I guess that just goes to show you how good Japanese gardens are at recreating large-scale natural landscapes at a very small scale because at the end of the day that's really a, a large part of what Japanese gardens are trying to do um, with different elements of the garden uh, reflecting natural elements such as uh, gravel waterfalls, reflecting rivers, or uh, rock work, reflecting real-life mountains, uh, things like this, and the the varied organic uh, shrubbery reflecting forests in real life. And from a distance and certain perspectives, uh, these kinds of early, uh, you know, it's it's almost a form of forced perspective techniques. Uh, really bring out a natural looking landscape at a very small scale. Anyway, I'm, I'm getting very off topic again. What I wanted to say is uh, the garden has a has a area with a, a small pavilion over the water which you can view the rest of the garden from and I thought this setup in particular was really cool and that's what inspired me uh, to have this whole area uh, be this, this, this stone bridge that goes through the lake and to have a pavilion over the water next to this kind of infiltrating into the habitat of the snow monkeys uh, but at the same time I did put some anti-climbing stuff on the pillars of the of the pavilion there which hopefully will work I'm really not sure we're just gonna have to see when I put these monkeys in in this habitat uh, just based on what the game calculates because it does allow you to see you know the range that the monkeys can go to so hopefully that'll be fine if not then honestly I'm just gonna see if I can deal with it I'm not even sure if they're gonna be able to swim in the game realistically in real life though they are so I want to be able to you know keep that in mind for the design of the habitat anyway uh, but yeah in the game it's going to be relevant whether they can swim regarding if they're going to escape or not and then when it comes to uh, some of the other details on the pathwork itself, I'm not really as concerned about security, so... Yeah, the fences are just simple rope fences with wooden posts and stone elements. I was kind of hoping that there would be a fence like this in the game as a standard element, uh, but it doesn't really matter, you can very easily make it yourself. By the way, I hope you don't hear my chair, it's being very loud, hold up. Now, it was at this point that I went back to Sean McBeard's video and looked at the creek that he built for his wolves which honestly is really cool and really makes very great use of the new water pieces that we have in this game I'm saying new because everything in this game just kind of feels new compared to Planet Coaster it really feels like an updated version of Planet Coaster so everything kind of feels new like a new object in something that I know rather than just a completely new game uh, that's kind of strange but yeah just trying to explain my questionable word choice there anyway uh, Sean built this really cool creek out of the waterfall pieces in the game 
uh, which works especially because there are certain pieces that simulate uh, water rippling effects on the water surface. So if you just use a bunch of these pieces, you can make uh, a stream that looks like flowing water. And then at certain point, uh, points in the stream, uh, whenever the water hits a rock or whenever it falls a little bit, uh, you can add some particles of the waterfall where you can, you can see it splash a bit. Uh, and altogether, I think it makes quite a realistic looking creek and definitely a million times better than all of the water in Planet Coaster. So that's mainly why I'm really happy about these kinds of things. Um, being able to build realistic waterfalls and things like that was uh, a part of the game which was sorely missing in Planet Coaster and I'm really happy that these water elements in Planet Zoo are so much better. And at this point, I also wanted to build some climbing elements and I didn't really feel like making these, you know, very man-made, making these out of the climbing platforms that the game provides. Again, I'm kind of screwing off my stats here, uh, because this is not going to help out the climbing statistic of the habitat. But, you know, these monkeys like climbing, and personally I felt it would look better if the climbing elements in the habitat are natural as opposed to man-made. Even though it's of course all man-made, but you know, at least look natural. So I decided to go with some logs, um, some stems of trees, throwing them in different directions and connecting them with vines that the monkeys can climb on. Now at this point I also decided to finish off some of the, uh, the surrounding perimeter of the habitats. So I'm trying to make some sort of combination between rock work and anti-climbing devices that I'm still not sure will actually work but they look legit enough. Uh, to try and make this area look natural while at the same time uh, preventing the monkeys from actually reaching the guests, uh, which would be catastrophic and probably uh, the game would give me a notification that a very dangerous animal has escaped at that point, even though it's just a Japanese macaque, but you know, that's how Planet Zoo rolls. Uh, a tiny little zebra escapes and it's like a life or death situation for all the people involved, to this game at least. Um, actually, Maybe this is a good time to give you some fun macaque facts. Uh, because I prepared them, might as well throw them out there. So, apparently these are the most northern living monkeys in the world. They live all the way up to the tip of Honshu, which is the main and largest island of Japan. Um, now, I'm saying the most northern living monkeys of the world. Obviously, they're the second most northern living. We humans are the most northern living monkeys. But you know, we're, we're always in first place as far as animal statistics are concerned. Uh, now monkeys always love uh, Japanese hot springs as well. Or sort of, I'm actually gonna get into that in a second. Uh, because while I definitely agree with them that Japanese onsens are amazing, uh, the famous hot spring macaques are in a place called Jigo Kudani Monkey Park. And they're more of a recent phenomenon. Uh, they live in a park with a man-made pool which is built from a natural uh, hot spring. And the monkeys are kind of capped here as a tourist attraction. They're not literally caged in, uh, but they're fed here. And as far as animal behavior goes, once you start feeding multiple generations of animals and they just come back and start relying on the humans for food, uh, it's just pretty much caged. Uh, at least, you know, not really physically, but functionally it's starting to depend on the humans in that area. And it's a bit strange, I haven't been there myself, um, but from what I can tell from scavenging a bit on the internet, it's not really even that much different anymore from seeing macaques at a zoo. It's really popular nowadays, uh, and the macaques are really only in this one man-made pool uh, with paths around it, and you can just constantly find tourists taking pictures of them around the macaques, so... It's very zoo-like, uh, which is... A shame as well because originally, as far as I'm aware, the spring was actually built to save the monkeys um, because back in the day uh, they were terrorizing farmers in the area uh, which were getting sick of their antics and then the uh, pool was built and uh, they started attracting the monkeys to get them out of other areas where they were being problematic. And the pool being in a national park is quite convenient uh, but now that it is so popular uh, it's it's very much a different story and I really don't want to say too much about it given that I haven't been there and you know This is supposed to be a happy-go-lucky video, uh, but ethically I feel it is a bit questionable Apparently the movie Baraka 
is the movie that made the monkeys famous. Uh, which if you're a movie patrician, uh, it's definitely a cool movie to watch. It doesn't have a narrative, it doesn't really have anything of a story. Uh, it's just a bunch of images that are really good looking and uh, cool in a row. Um, personally, I wouldn't even be able to see it in one sitting, just uh, short clips are cool. Uh, but yeah, next time you see the monkeys in a movie like that, contemplating and relaxing and looking very philosophical and natural and beautiful, uh, realize that probably out of frame there is a giant horde of tourists taking pictures. So, I'm sorry for ruining your dreams and for being a pessimist here, but that is the reality of the Japanese monkeys in uh, the, the hot springs in the snow. And besides, uh, the play looks very terrible if it's not snowing, uh, so that's something that it relies on as well. That said, um, having hot springs in zoos has now become more of a common thing. Um, well, Tobu Zoo for one has a hot spring, uh, Lincoln Park as well. Uh, that sounds like Lincoln Park. Um, so yeah, that is, you can see macaques in hot springs in other places as well. And it won't be that much less natural than these uh, macaques that are in Japan. Uh, now, wait, I forgot that I was trying to list fun facts about macaques. Uh, one more fact then, uh, they make snowballs, which is really cool, and then ro roll them off of hills, or things like this. So, they're acting kind of human-like sometimes. It's almost like we're uh, distant descendants or something. Now, in the meantime, I've almost finished up the Japanese garden around the habitat. Uh, just trying to fill it in with many organically looking small shrubs and uh, elements and lots of rock work uh, to make it look like a Japanese garden. But at that point I realized that I wasn't really happy with the stone lantern that was in the game. Uh, not to say that it's a bad lantern, uh, but it's not really the kind of lantern that I would place in a garden like this. So uh, I decided to build my own stone lantern, which I think is very doable with some of the classic pieces. We have some really nice and very small stone pieces which you can make uh, anything out of. I'll probably put this lantern on the workshop uh, and I'll put a, a link to it in the description and whatever else from this build I can put on the workshop as well probably. But yeah, uh, Japanese stone lanterns are originally from China, like much of Japanese culture. To be honest, somebody's got to say it. Uh, and there are many different types. Now specifically this one is called a Yukimi Doro which is a very typical garden lantern. Uh, I was actually inspired to build this one uh, after Kyushibarikyu, which is a garden in Tokyo in Shiodome, which has a really big stone lantern next to the lake, uh, which is very similar to this one. And I always thought that was really pretty and one of my favorite spots in any Japanese garden. So I wanted to build something like that. So hence I'm building this specific type of uh, lantern and uh, Yukimi Doro specifically is a lagged lantern, and like all kinds of Japanese stone lanterns, apparently its parts are based on the five elements of Buddhism. I couldn't find too many sources on this, but one of them is Wikipedia, so I'm just gonna trust them on this one. Uh, so the legs refer to earth, uh, water is represented by the plates which are on top of that, and then on top of that is the actual lights, which represents fire. Uh, and then there is the cap, the sort of roof piece of the lantern, which represents the wind. And finally, uh, but you won't see much of this in the time lapse, there is a, a small piece just on top of the lantern pointing to the sky, which refers to uh, the Japanese word of Sora, which is hard to translate, I suppose. Uh, it means air or heaven or sky or void, something very spiritual and up there. Uh, but yeah, it's really cool to have these sort of different meanings within the lanterns. And originally they also came from Buddhist temples, although now they're being used in gardens and Shinto temples as well. Uh, but I've always been really a big fan of Japanese lanterns. I would love to buy one, although I recently uh, went on the internet to see how expensive they are to get here in the Benelux. And they're pretty pricey if you want to get the real deal, so I think I'm skipping on that one. But uh, yeah, I think they're really cool. So I'll put this one on the workshop, and um, I'm not gonna put, I'm not gonna throw any shade at the lantern that is already in the game because it's really nice, but it is a different type of lantern and not quite the one that I was looking for. Anyway, with that built 
it is the end of this time lapse. I just added some extra things at the end, like uh, education and donation boxes and path elements to finish the habitats. But at this point, it's time to open it to the monkeys and to the public and see how they enjoy it. I hope you guys enjoyed this video in any case, and I'll see you in the next one when hopefully I'll be a bit healthier and uh, have some kind of other standalone habitat build for a different animal. Bye guys!